All right, welcome everyone. Thanks so much for attending our monthly College of Natural Sciences webinar. So my name is Alison Sherwood and I'm the Interim Associate Dean for our college. Through this Polina uh, webinar series, we're aiming to reach the broader community to share the world-class research that happens both in the College of Natural Sciences as well as in our sister units here on the Manoa campus. And today's presentation features Dr. Philip Williams, who is a professor and the department chair of the Department of Chemistry here in the College of Natural Sciences. Dr. Williams received his undergraduate education in chemistry from the University of Calgary in Canada and his PhD with a focus on marine natural products from the University of Hawaii at Manoa. And he graduated in 2003. So after postdoctoral work at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography in San Diego and California with Bill Fenekal from 2003 to 2006, he returned back home here to UH Manoa to join the faculty as an assistant professor. And over the last number of years, he's risen up through the ranks and he's now a full professor in the department. Dr. Williams' research interests focus on natural products chemistry and isolation and structure determination and natural products methodologies. His research accomplishments were recognized by the American Society of Pharmacognosy with the Matt Suffness Award in 2012. And so now I'd like to turn our presentation time over to Dr. Philip Williams for his talk entitled Medicines from the Sea. Thank you, Thank Philip. You. Thank you, Allison. Share screen. Okay, well, thank you for the opportunity to talk today about something that I've uh, spent a long time um, studying and really sort of in, are passionate about. And that is really um, looking at chemicals that are made by nature and asking all sorts of questions about what we can do with them, and what do they look like. Uh, again, relevant for today's talk really is this idea of what can we do with these, these things that are made um, in nature. And the talk is going to be kind of a very general talk um, for the audience today, uh, rather than focus specifically on my research. But where I'd like to start, where I'd like to start is with a Hawaiian legend. So this is a legend of uh, Limo Makio Hana, or the, the seaweed of death from Hana. So as, as the legend goes, long ago on the island of Maui, near sort of modern day Hana, there was a fishing village. And uh, this was a, a normal fishing village in, in all respects. Um, soon uh, villagers would go out, fish every day, bring back their catch. What they noticed after time though is, is that more frequently than other villages, fishermen didn't come back. So some of the fishermen went missing. And after, over time, the villagers realized that whenever this happened, whenever this happened, whenever a fisherman didn't come back, the hermit that lived up the hill had gone swimming that day. And so being villagers, and they did the sort of thing that villagers and these sorts of stories do, they grabbed sort of the equivalent pitchforks and torches and ran up the hill and accosted the, the poor man who was sitting by his fire, trying to warm himself up in the evening. They grabbed him, ripped off his cloak, and they saw, in fact, he was not a, a man at all, but he was a shark god. Uh, he had huge teeth covering his entire back in the shape of a mouth. And the shark god had been going out, killing the villagers, uh, the fishermen, and, and feasting on their flesh. So enraged, the fishermen ripped the villager or ripped the hermit to pieces, burned his ashes in his fire, or burned him in his fire, and then took the ashes and threw them in a nearby tidal pool. What they did not count on though, is that the evil of the, of the hermit, evil of the shark god was so great that it transformed the pool. And the pool slowly became coated with shark mouse, little brown anemones began to coat the walls. They found over time that to touch these and to be in this pool would, would brought death. And so they would coat their spears and, and knives within the pool before battle and it would surely bring death to their victims. So thus these, these little creatures in this little tidal pool on uh, Maui became known as Limo Maki Ohana, the seaweed of death from Hana. Fast forward through to about the 1960s. And there is a professor in the chemistry department here at the University of Hawaii Manoa named Paul Scheuer. Uh, Paul had arrived uh, in the University of Hawaii around the 1940s. Um, 
having just finished a PhD in Harvard, and he became sort of fascinated with the chemical constituents of sort of wine plants to start with, and then worked on this uh, area. Over time, though, he began to really kind of appreciate the marine environment and started turning his focus towards this. So Paul Scheuer here is actually known as the father of the field of marine natural products, uh, which is a large field that I'm involved with. Among his various interests, he's quite an eclectic man, uh, was really sort of a passion about Hawaii and about learning about the Hawaiian culture. And as part of his studies, he ran across this a reference to the Hawaiian spear of poison, the Momaki Ohana, and decided that he as a chemist needed to try and figure out what this was and find this pool. So only a few people knew the location of this pool, uh, but eventually he managed, and, and some other scientists at UH managed to convince someone to, to take them there. Uh, they collected samples uh, at that pool and brought them back to, to Oahu. As it turns out this samples they collected were entirely new species of Zuzanthelae, uh, which they named Palithoa toxicica. And from the, these samples, they isolated a, a toxin. They didn't know what the structure was, but they isolated a toxin at the time that they called palitoxin. Now, this is the, the chemical structure of palitoxin. And, and there's a sort of a 20 year odyssey from the initial collection of the samples to the point at which this, this structure becomes, um, uh, becomes known. We'll talk a little bit about that last. Now, uh, for those of you who are familiar with, with chemistry and how we represent structures, this makes sense already. If you're not, don't worry too much about it. Essentially, each one of these little connections is an atom. Uh, the O represent oxygens, the N represent nitrogens. What I'd like you to take away from this is, is not the chemical structure, but just an appreciation for the complexity of this structure. The, this and figuring this out is widely viewed as- Join the meeting as one of the most heroic sort of uh, structure determinations in, in my field. It's the Mona Lisa of, uh, of the field. Um, and we'll talk more about that in a sec. But I think everyone here, regardless of where you understand the structure or not, can appreciate the complexity. Uh, simply put, imagine that I took the strut slide away and then asked you to redraw that from memory. Uh, everyone's gonna have a tough time with that, right? Because of the complexity that is represented there. As a chemist, as a natural products chemist, so studying natural products, which are these, these chemicals that are made by the environment. What I find incredible about the structure is this this really crazy, unique chemical structure. Uh, it's an incredibly complex chemical structure that was hallucinated in 1981. Uh, it inspired all sorts of new chemical methods and tools to try and figure out the connectivity of all the atoms and the shape of the molecule. Um, by modern standards, this is just amazing. Um, for perspective, again, if I was trying to, to describe this to, to, to non-specialists, I have a four-year-old and I have lots of Lego in my house. So imagine for I, I built that, so this structure out of Lego. And I built this entire structure, as you saw there in that complexity out of Lego, and then shoved it in one of my, my, my shopping bags. And then gave that to you, along with after putting oven mitts on your hand and saying, figure out what that structure is by feel. Right? That, that is sort of the equivalent of, of what had to happen here. You could break it into smaller pieces. You could analyze those smaller pieces in the same way, but you're really kind of blind on blind trying to figure out what, what this molecule is through a set of very simplistic type, type techniques of the day. Because of that complexity, all sorts of new chemical methods and chemical tools had to be developed to solve this. Add to that in terms of this challenge that this molecule is incredibly potent. It is incredibly toxic. So, uh, if you want to rank the things that are toxic, that can kill you, that are naturally occurring, there's plutonium and then there's palytoxin. Right? This, is, this is how it works in, in, in the order. Things like ricin, if you remember Breaking Bad, uh, where Walter tried to poison people with ricin, yeah, it's about 10,000 times less potent. Palytoxin is up there, this is it. So imagine trying to work with large amounts of this material or something that could kill you in the microgram quantities. This is just incredible sort of heroic work. Add to this in the story, that the way which palytoxin exerts its biological effect, the way that which, which it kills, was entirely new at the time. So no one had ever seen this before and, and, and using this as a biochemical tool, elucidated all sorts of uh, information about how sodium and potassium pumps work. For those of you that are, are, are sort of saltwater aquarium enthusiasts, you probably have heard of palytoxin already. It remains sort of a human health issue. Uh, so uh, every year, one or two people 
uh, get poisoned by palytoxin. They have this in their saltwater aquariums. They get field collected material brought into their aquarium. It's contaminated with palytoxin producing organisms. And then while they're cleaning their, their aquarium or, um, or just get spray from the water, they inhale these, these or get cut with things that contain palytoxin and, and then have to go to the hospital over this. As you might imagine, relevant to today's talk, for something that is so incredibly potent and has such interesting biological activity, there have been a number of attempts to kind of turn palytoxin from when uh, in the 1980s to a drug that would be brought to market. For example, Hawaii Biotech spent a lot of time working on this in um, around 2000. But in general, this has been unsuccessful to date. And, and there are many reasons for this. But there are three I'd like to focus on and sort of highlight in terms of this talk. And we'll come back to these with some examples later on to show how we can solve these problems. But the general problems that we're encountering here are issues of toxicity. So biological effects are good, but off, you know, toxicity to other things that we don't want is bad. So if something's very potent, it's often difficult to, to dial that in correctly. The other issue that, that is a real concern is you need to be able to have enough of this material to do something with. You need to be able to produce enough of this material reliably to provide a drug to market, right? Or to provide studies along the way. So a sustainable supply is, is, is a critical concern. That for a case of palytoxin is challenging because of the chemical complexity. For perspective, uh, at the time of its discovery, it was the largest non-protein toxin known it's around 3,600 atomic mass units for those that are familiar with that scale. So it's really sort of an amazingly large molecule. And it's not like a protein where the, the units repeat. Each of the units is different and unique and that makes it an incredible challenge to, to try and solve. But when you think about a molecule like this, when you think about palytoxin, you think about this incredible structure, this is massive structure with this incredible potency. You've got to think, well, why does it make it? Why in the world? Where the Zuzanthelli develop and devote all of this energy, all this metabolic energy and materials to making these types of compounds. And I think the, the usual explanation that, that's, that's given here is one which is competition for space and resources. So if you look at a coral reef or you consider the marine environment and the number of interactions that happen uh, um, during any length of time, they're incredibly frequent, right? Uh, we have, example, a great picture of sponges up here, and you look at how they're all sort of growing and clustering next to each other. You have a coral reef here. Join the meeting. All sorts of life in it. And there really are two, you know, broadly, two basic strategies one can envision, right? Um, broadly. And one is that you're going to survive and win in this environment by growing faster than everyone else and just out-competing everyone else in terms of that, that, that growth. Uh, or you're gonna chemically defend yourself. You're gonna have some sort of a method of defending yourself uh, from others that come next to you or from being eaten. And so this is where natural products kind of come in, where we think one of the main reasons they're made by these organs, why they invest all this energy to make them is for defensive purposes. But the question comes into what can we use these for? And what historically have we used these for? Well, this chart's a little busy and I'll walk you through it, but it really is trying to sum up this question of what do we use natural products for? And this chart comes from um, uh, David Newman, who used to work for the National Cancer Institutes. And really what it is, is asking the question of where do the approved drugs in the US come from? What is the source? If you trace back the chemical structure, where did, where did it originate from? And this is looking at a 40 year period, 1981 to, to 2019. Obviously quite relevant to our, our day and age, about 8% of those now are vaccines. Right? This is pre-COVID time, but about 8% are vac vaccines. Another 18% are biological, and this is a massive growing area. This is an area that is really sort of exploding. Uh, so with synthetic biology and other tools become more, more relevant. But if you look at how where we've gotten them for originally, this area in green right here, although it's subdivided into a couple of categories, this area in green really represents compounds and drugs that are really natural products or their derivatives. So natural products where we have the central core and maybe we append one or two groups to it to make a derivative to, to improve its, its, its either efficacy or other properties as, as needed. So that's about 25%. There's another 25% here, which is in sort of orange and this little part in yellow. Uh, which I would say, and, and David generally calls, sort of inspired by natural products. So this is an idea where if you look at the chemical structure, 
at, at first glance, you might say that's not related to a natural product. But if you trace down the history of that structure and why it's going after a particular target and how it does that, and then the really nuances of that inter interaction, you see that that was really information that, that came about through natural products research. So all told, if, if, you, if you accept that argument, you have about 25% over here, 25% over here. And so there's about 50% of all drugs historically through this period that, that are derived from natural products, derived from sort of natural sources. So right about now, I think everyone's probably trying to go, okay, so if 50% of the drugs are from natural products, can I think of an example? And I'll go old school for this, um, and because it's relevant again to the University of Hawaii and the chemistry department here. And we'll talk very briefly about Alice Ball, who some of you may be familiar with. So Alice Ball was the first woman uh, and the first person of African ancestry to earn a master's degree from the University of Hawaii. I think it was the College of Hawaii at that time, officially 1914. So her work on her, her master's thesis actually focused on kava, um, that she did, um, elucidating the chemical structures and constituents of, more the constituents of kava. Um, but also she got inspired through interactions with a local physician, it's believed, to uh, get involved in, in, in chamuga oil, which is um, an oil that had been used in, in India to treat Hansen's disease, the leprosy. And so, so through her efforts here in, at the University of Ohio Manoa, she created derivatives of chamuga oil uh, that greatly improved uh, it, their efficacy and the way that they could be delivered. Um, and so this, this became sort of the classic treatment for Hansen's disease for the better part of, of 20, 20 years. Um, and her contribution, again, is now something that has been recognized in this effort. But there are lots of other examples of natural products that are, that are derived from, uh, like everyone uses uh, penicillin being sort of another classic example of that. So what is, what is special about natural products that, that kind of drives this, um, this similarity to drugs or that drives, drives the fact that we, we can get drugs from them and use these types of compounds as drugs? And in, in a word, simply, again, this is rather a fancy plot, but, but the key thing here is a representation of diversity. What you've got here is sort of a two-dimensional grid of the diversity of sort of synthetic compounds that are available by a very common approach, synthetic chemistry. What you see in purple here in the middle is the chemo that representation of the chemical space of natural products. Notice how much more spread out that is. And then you, you have a, the chemical space of all, all the approved drugs at the time, this is 2004. And notice how these two sort of overlap a lot better, how the, this, the natural product space, chemical space, really represents the drug space a lot better than what we can, could access at that time in 2004. So we understand that natural products are a, a great source of potential drugs and compounds that we can use to understand our, our biological systems. And a lot of that has to do with their complexity, their diversity. You saw a perfect example of that in, in palytoxin. Um, but where do we look? Well, um, for me, you know, uh, obviously, uh, given what I'm talking about, the marine environment is, is captured my interest. 70% um, of the world's surface is covered with water. And so this represents a, a great um, venue to, to look for, for new natural products for organisms that live in really unique environments and therefore potentially make unique natural products to deal with those unique situations. Um, so with the advent of scuba and everything, uh, the world kind of opened up, the underwater world opened up. And so the first marine drug is generally thought to be, or the first marine drive drug, is thought to be the work of a man named Werner Bergman in the 1950s. And so he was a chemist who lived on the East Coast and got really interested in sponges and these foul odors that they would uh, give off. And so he went down to Florida and started extracting out compounds um, to, to st study them and published this paper in 1951. Discovered this compound that's called spongothymidine, which doesn't look all that, that un interesting or unusual. But what was eventually became kind of unusual about this is this is related to thymidine, you know, the, the DNA nucleosides, right? That we see incorporated into DNA. What's different about it is it has this hydroxy group here, this, this extra group right here that's not present in DNA. And this was sort of startling to people at the time to realize that you could make these types of modifications and these types of modifications existed in nature um, different than what was seen in, in DNA structures. And this 
and some of the biological activity associated with this compound sparked a whole area of, of research into these sort of anti-metabolites compounds that resemble these bases and led to the development of, of a number of drugs. So RSC, for example, is, is a compound that's actually found in the sponges, uh, that, which is actually used right now to treat leukemia and lymphomas. Further development along the same sort of basic structural class on these ideas of these unusual modifications to this level led to the development of, of AZT, right, which of course was one of the early treatments, antiviral treatments for, for AIDS. Uh, there's also um, cyclovir, which is a uh, herpes infection treatment that is along the same class. So there's a lot of really great work that kind of came out from this really early discovery of this modified nucleoside right here by Bergman. Now you have to go forward a number of years to get to the next marine drug. There was sort of a drought for a while, shall I say, uh, where there really wasn't that many people looking at it, I think. But if, if you fast forward to um, but 2000-ish, we get to the work of, of Toto Oliveira. And so the way I want to, to sort of phrase this and think about this is, well, you have this sort of whole ocean to explore. So how do you choose what to go and look at? And Toto uh, had grew up in the Philippines. And then he moved to the United States in, in his teen years, and he worked his way through the academic system, eventually becoming a assistant professor at the University of Utah. But at that time, he never really forgot about some of the things that he'd seen as a boy while snorkeling around and living in the Philippines. And one of them are these cone snails. And so this is a video I'm gonna show you from, from J.P. Bingham, who, who is at University of Hawaii Manoa here, is kind enough to give this to me a few years ago. And what you're seeing here is a cone snail. And this little thing sticking out, this little harpoon proboscis sticking out um, is going to move around in this video. And what you're gonna see is there a fish is gonna come in and the fish is, is dead, it's in the pair of forceps. And it's gonna come in from the left-hand side and, and the proboscis is gonna poke around the fish until it's suddenly gonna shoot out, smack into the fish and then suck it into the mouth. So let me play this for you. There. So, and if you if you got the audio of that, that was JP. Um, sorry, I forgot to edit that out. Um, but what you saw there, and what's amazing about that is in the wild, the fish is moving, it's going through. This proboscis comes out, strikes it, stops dead in an instant. They just freeze. And this is a fascinating thing about how what sort of poison or toxin could do this so rapidly to the fish that allows them to then be sucked into the, the cone snail. So Toto started a, a research program to try and unravel this mystery. And what this led to was discovery that the, the venom of these cone snails was actually a very complex mixture of proteins. And one of them, when you fist them out and separate them and test their individual components, led to the development of, or is now currently an FDA approved drug in 2004, this was approved under the name of Prealt. Zirconotide is the name of it. And this comes direct, um, was manufactured now by a long corporation. So they make this synthetically in the lab because uh, of protein, this, is, this can be done. And what it's used for is the treatment of, of, of chronic pain. So it happens to be a non-opioid treatment of chronic pain, which uh, obviously is something that's very important. It's also a non-local anesthetic. So it's a general um, for the treatment of pain. And importantly, patients don't develop any signs of tolerance or addiction. So this is, seems like a great thing for those people who are on chronic pain. Uh, the downside is if you, if you look at the structure and you think about the structure and this large protein that it is, um, this is not something that you can just ingest. Uh, so this unfortunately has to be administered through a pump um, directly into the brain of the patients. Uh, so I, you don't get to leave the hospital usually for this sort of stuff. Um, but for what it does, it works exceptionally well and, and became the second FDA approved marine drug in 2014 or 2004. So this is an example of how you can kind of decide what to collect in this marine environment um, based on ecological observations. Well, the palytoxin one is one based on sort of historical knowledge. Another example, uh, a way you can do this, and a very common way to do this, example, is sort of this unbiased collection and screening. Go out into the marine environment, as, as I've done, uh, collect samples that you find there in abundance, bring them back to the lab, 
do some sort of extraction. We're all familiar with this process. We all make coffee in the morning. It's essentially the same thing to start with. So we use different technique and different equipment for this, solvents for this. And then take that mixture that we get and separate it out into components and, and place them on uh, into wells or vials that we can then use to test in a variety of assays. And my group in particular has done either anti-cancer or neurological uh, with Alzheimer's or antibiotic work. And this is just a small selection. A perfect example of this approach working is, is the work of Paul Scheuer. So Paul J. Scheuer here, uh, again, the father of the field of marine natural products. Uh, as the rumor goes, the story goes on this, one summer, the, the air conditioning went out in Bilger um, into the chemistry building where, where we're based and the, the fume hoods uh, couldn't, didn't work as well. And so he took his entire research group out for the entire summer and they basically went all around the entire island collecting every single day um, and in the water every single day. And a lot of great stuff came out of that. But they collected a large number of samples, brought them back, and then screened them in a number of biological assays, in this case, and some anti cancer screens. And one sample in particular uh, came up as being incredibly potent, incredibly active. And this was a sample that was actually collected in Kahala here at Black Point. And what they collected was this sea slug right here. This Alicia sea slug that, it, depending on the time of year, can form thousands in blooms um, in this particular location. And what they found when they, when they went in and looked at the extracts of, of the sea slug was that it contained a whole series of compounds that they named the cohalides. <clears throat> One in particular, cohalide F, shown here again, and the structure is not particularly important, but just place that size in perspective to, to palytoxin really seem to have a, a unique biological activity. And so in collaboration with, with Pharmamar, which at the time was a Spanish biotech company, they start to understand how, what is the mechanism of action of this compound? How is it exerting its, its effect in the cells? And it, it turned out to be totally different than what had been seen uh, for a lot of other anti-cancer drugs. So again, unraveling new biology and new targets. Uh, and it, over the time, this compound has been evaluated in a couple different phase two clinical trials. So there's a phase one you go through first, phase two and phase three, if you're not familiar with this, phase two is almost it's usually efficacy, it doesn't work. Uh, and so it's been uh, in trials for liver cancer, um, non-small cell lung cancers, melanomas, and, and as well as psoriasis. Uh, somewhere in the last, I think, 10 years, Pharmamar has discontinued this, and this is more of a business decision, I think, than anything uh, dealing with the compound and, and problems associated with that. Um, but they usually then license it out to someone else, and it may get picked up again at some point in time. But the story here about Kahalite F is also an interesting story for another reason, because it goes back to what will be a theme in this talk as well this question of who really makes it. So these types of compounds, if you're familiar, you know, turn out to be kind of unusual for a, for a sea slug. We don't find them in other sea slugs we look at. We don't see these types of compounds. And in ecological observations, what became clear is that this sea slug was actually eating the bryopsis. And so going and collecting the bryopsis, this green algae species, and then extracting that showed that actually the cohalide F was present, although in lower concentrations in this biopsis species. So the idea then is that there's a bioaccumulation going on here where this uh, sea slug is accumulating cohalide F and the cohalides in its body, possibly to stop it from being eaten by other things that bite into it and then it's unpalatable. Uh, but the real producer is, is biopsis species. Well, it turns out as you fast forward a number of years, this also is not true. Um, it turns out that there's likely a Vibrio bacteria that grows on the biopsis that is actually the producer of the cohalide Fs. And that's important for, for some reasons that we'll talk about in a sec here. Um, but in its center of a general theme is that, that you'll see is that these microbial producers are also often responsible for these compounds we, we isolate from these macro organisms. So again, staying in Hawaii and, and, and asking the question of how do you know what to look at? So another really uh, common way to, to answer that, to, to, to figure out what in the whole ocean that you're gonna look at is, is to look at the human health interactions. And so what we have uh, here in the Moore lab, um, Dick Moore, who was originally a postdoc of, of Paul Scheuer, uh, who originally, I originally collected the samples of palytoxin, 
in that 20 year adventure to do the structure, as it turns out, I forgot to mention this, but in that 20 year adventure to determine the structure, this was actually Dick Moore's project. So Paul had sort of stepped aside and Dick who was a postdoc with me became a faculty member here and became well known for his work in this field. Uh, really the palytoxin structure was really a race between him and a number of groups around the world. And it was really him and one other person usually on the, U, the, the University of Hawaii side. And in the end, they, they actually um, figured out most of the structure. So it's quite an amazing accomplishment here. But he became interested as well over time in again, looking at more of Hawaii's marine resources. And, and in particular, he became interested in looking at cyanobacteria. And again, in the late seventies, one of the things that was going on is there was a number of reports of surfers who were coming back with rather severe blistering and rashes on the east side of Oahu. And so Dick, hypothesized that what might be going on was that the blue-green algae, the cyanobacteria that were algae that was, was in these locations was being pulled up by the heavy surf and then somehow coming into contact in the swim trunks or bikinis of the surfers. And that these co compounds that were produced by the, the cyanobacteria might be responsible for this sort of blistering. And so this is on sort of this, this um, Kailua side right in here, Waimanalo side is where, where a lot of this happened. So, Collecting the samples and continuing to, to look at this led to the discovery of this compound here, which is, this is limbia toxin. And Dick was able to show that, that this particular compound was responsible for this horrible, horrible blistering. What I've shown here is a relatively mild case of it, but the blisters get quite severe. And um, because of the location, I can't show the pictures <laughs> in the, the talk, right? Um, so the, 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 they're really quite severe. It turns out these compounds are really quite fascinating because again, they kind of illustrated a, a really unusual biological effect, in which case it was really um, that they were interacting at that time with, with protein kinase C, if you're familiar with that, which then is important in sort of a long large number of, of cell processes. But this work with limbia toxin then prompted Dick Moore to continue to look around the island and back in our Mauna Loa Bay area, right, as, as well as up, up here in, in, in um, Haleiwa areas, they discovered at a different depth, so different, different depths, large blooms of cyanobacteria here that produce an entirely different looking compound. This one's called a plesiotoxin. But a plesiotoxin actually exerts the same biological effects as limbiotoxin. They're very similar in what they do. And what's really kind of interesting about these compounds is, is they are very effective at, 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 at interrupting cancer cells and killing cancer cells. They can do this in certain, certain cells. But more than that, more than that, they're actually co-carcinogens. So if you are exposed to these compounds, one does not develop cancer. But if you're exposed to something that causes cancer and these compounds, which is the top slide here, you get a massive growth of the, of the cancer cells. So it just turns everything on. And this is really sort of a fascinating sort of human health uh, situation here. As it turns out, if, if you've ever, you know, been in the water around Hawaii and you're interested in algae and you, you collect algae um, or you eat algae you collect in the Hawaiian Islands, this becomes really kind of a concern, right? Um, so the cyanobacteria often grows within things like glass brassiolaria that people like to eat. Uh, and so making sure that you've cleaned this out when these produce all sorts of these, these cancer promoting type compounds is really a, a concern. So uh, an example of this would be sort of around the mid nineties, there was a whole series of food poisonings on Maui uh, that was attributed to people that were eating Gracilaria. And when they really tracked this down, it turns out they weren't just eating Gracilaria, they were eating Gracilaria with the cyanobacterium in it uh, as part of the assemblage. And that was what was making them really ill. Um, so let's transition back to the palytoxin story. That's a little bit as a, as a focal point. So we've talked a little bit about, you know, what are natural products? Um, we've talked a little bit about why they're somewhat interesting and challenging. We've talked about uh, what we can use them for. We've talked about how you would go about looking in the environment or deciding what you're gonna look at. And if we go back to the palytoxin story, which is this incredibly potent and interesting compound, I said there was a couple of reasons why this, this didn't progress as a drug. And the, one of them is toxicity, but the other really is this sustainable supply, being able to get enough material for it. And that's really the issues with getting enough material is really driven by the chemical complexity. 
that this is very difficult to, to build and make. So I want to talk a little bit about two stories uh, of marine drugs that were developed that really focus or, or highlight some things in this supply area and chemical complexity area. And I'll try and go quick here. So halochondrin B is a, a compound that was isolated by Dissecchio Mura, a Japanese chemist, a Japanese had a, a massive area interest in marine toxins along with uh, the US, the two powerhouses for years, from this halochondra sponge in Okinawa. So it was isolated around Okinawa. In 1986, they discovered this particular compound. So notice the complexity is, is, is much more than something like limbia toxin. This compound discovered in 1986 was almost immediately flagged by the National Cancer Institute as something that they really wanted to prioritize for its anti-cancer activities, a potential new anti-cancer drug. Its activity against a particular cell line was around 0.3 nanomolar, which is, is exceptional. It looked like it had a relatively unique mechanism of action. So again, the federal government had set up tools that allow you to, to do this sort of stuff, what we call the 60 cell line. But the challenge was how do you get enough material? How do you get enough of this material to be able to actually develop this and examine this? And so they uh, had tried to do aquaculture approaches where you're growing marine sponges on large ropes without much success. There was a, a chemical synthesis. So Yurisu Kishi at Harvard uh, managed to do this in 1992, which again is a heroic effort to make this. To put this in perspective, this thing takes about a hundred steps to make and gives you an overall yield of 1%. So if you start with 100 grams of material, you end up with less than one gram on the best case scenario. So not a practical way to, to make this for clinical trials and large amounts needed. But what it did do, what synthesis, chemical synthesis did do, was allow you to make modifications to various parts of the molecule. Allows you to ask questions like, if I break this in half and just look at the act, test the right-hand side of this, does this retain the biological activity? What is responsible? What part of the molecule is responsible for the biological activity? And how can I improve this? And that type of work by Asai, Edward Suet's Asai, uh, who had worked with Yokishi, led to this simplified analog on the left, a much smaller, less complex molecule where we sort of chopped off all this stuff on the right, on the left hand side here. This became Halivern, which became approved in 2010 from treatments of metastatic breast cancer and lipid sarcomas. So again, an illustration of how chemical synthesis can really help answer this problem of the supply issue if we can get the compounds down to the right size or how chemical synthesis can allow us to modify very parts of the molecule and understand their, their function. A completely different approach to this, uh, which goes back to this question of, of how, who makes it influences the supply issue. So I've said a couple of times that bacteria have been making these compounds. The example that comes up is ET743 in Dallas. So this was a compound originally isolated by Ken Reinhardt in Illinois from a C a squirt right here, this beautiful little creature right here, and led to the isolation of this, this compound on here, on the right-hand side, ET743. Again, uh, incredibly effective against certain types of, of cancers that were resistant to other types of drug treatments. Uh, it works by basically causing double stand DNA breakages and over time, this has finally been approved for the treatment uh, in Europe of sarcomas and a bunch of ovarian cancers. But relevant to this story and, and who really makes it, it didn't take long for people to look at the chemical structure of ET743 right here and say, this chemical structure is actually quite similar to other structures, other compounds here, here, and here that we can find being produced by bacteria, by actinobiases and bacteria streptomyces. That leads to the hypothesis that despite this being a C squirt, that maybe there's a bacteria living in there that is actually producing it. So maybe it's a situation like our Vibrio situation with Kohala F. And this took a tremendous amount of work to try and figure this out. But in the last few years, the Sherman Group at the University of Michigan has done this and has been able to identify through large genomic sequencing and metagenomic sequencing analysis, a, a bacteria, an endosymbiont that actually makes this compound ET743. It's an endosymbiont. It's something that, that is actually a true symbiont in that sense. It can't be removed from the bacteria and cultured independently. It grows with the bacteria. So all we have is the, geno the, the genome for it. But what's the big deal? Why do I keep harping on the, these bacterial sources? Well, because if you go back to the 1930s in the, you know, and back to the work of Salman uh, Waxman or Alexander Fleming, 
and the significance of their work in which uh, Waxman really uh, figured out or discovered that certain orders of, of bacteria, certain types of bacteria are actually really uh, prolific producers of chemicals that are biologically active, uh, things that become drugs. And Fleming's work, uh, when he discovered that penicillin uh, could be produced by fungi and that this had antibacterial effects. This basically started a whole transition in terms of how modern pharmacopoeia worked and really that the fact that we could grow these bacteria up in large reactors and ferment them meant that we had solved the supply issue. And so the discovery of, of these types of compounds, the bacterial symbiont being produced for it, and the discovery of, of being able to go in and then identify a gene cluster. And again, don't worry what this is. These are the genes here, and this is the predicted biosynthetic pathway, how it's made. The key point is that when, when we work with bacteria, we actually have a very large number of tools that have been developed over time to allow us to take and manipulate genes, to do synthetic biology, for example, or molecular biology. So you can take these genes, you can manipulate them to try and make these types of derivatives that we try and do synthetically. You can express these, this entire pathway in another organism, something that is very easily and grows fast, like E. coli. And then you can solve the supply issue through fermentation. So this is really sort of a, where the field is going and what it's trying to do is to really take these, these, these gene clusters and find the genes that are responsible for the production of these types of compounds, move them into bacteria, and then be able to work and manipulate with them at that leisure. And solve the, really this, this supply issue. So I'm doing a time. going back to, to palytoxin, they say the um, or two issues of supply and chemical how chemical complexity relates to that. The other issue that really became an issue with, with palytoxin, I said, was the toxicity. And I'm going to use maybe one more story very quickly to illustrate how modern approaches to, to solving that. To do that, I'm going to return to cyanobacteria, which is one of my favorite uh, organisms and a compound called dolostatin-10. So dolostatin-10 is, is a, a peptide here um, that was originally isolated from this C here, dolabella auriculara, uh, collected in the Indian Ocean. And that was work done by, by George Pettit, who was again a giant in this field. He has a number of contributions. But one of the things that um, became apparent early on, although the NCI was very interested in these compounds, was that they didn't get very much from it. The yield is like 10 to the minus seven from the, the sea air. Many years later, the, the Moore group working here in Hawaii, in collaboration with some, some collaborators in, in Guam, discovered that dolostan 10 was actually produced by a cyanobacterium, and it was produced at about 10,000 times the levels found in the dolabella. So the sea slug is eating the cyanobacteria, and therefore it's acquiring this compound through its diet, and this compound makes it unpalatable, we think, to, to predators. But the problem with, with dolostan-10 and the development of dolostan-10 has really been issues, one of them, one of them is issues with toxicity it, it, and other, but primarily toxicity. So how do you mitigate this issue of toxicity? How are, how are people approaching it these days? So if, if you think about this problem in the most simplistic sense, the drug needs to reach a specific target or location to have beneficial effects. And the problem is that interactions with other targets or other locations causes toxicity, again, in the most simplest sense. So the solution that, that really has come to the forefront in the last decade or so and has been this idea of antibody drug conjugates to essentially put a targeting system on the compound. So the idea here is that you have a cancer cell and you take, get some sort of antibody to it, you do, to something in the cancer cell, and then somehow you take your toxin, your, your marine natural product, and you link it to the antibody so that when you then give this to the patient, the antibody essentially guides this whole package to the cancer cell. Once it's at the cancer cell, this linker cleaves, and the toxin then is in proximity to the biological target that you want it to interact with and have its effect. And so it doesn't interact with things along the way. So this um, is a perfect example of, of the work that was done by a company called Seattle Genomics to harness the, the Dolostatin 10 series into a, an antibody drug conjugate for it was approved in 2011, really for the treatment of, of lymphoma and Hodgkin's lymphomas. The basic structures here, here's the, the natural product, the Dolostatin 10 that we saw before. 
Here is this linker unit right here. And on the left-hand side is in, just represented by these couple letters is a very large antibody that is the targeting system. So they, they inject the antibody ends up taking it to his particular target, um, um, CD30 in this case. Uh, then this linker gets cleaved by enzymes in the body. And then this is released right next to the target that you want it to engage with. So it's very effective. And so right now, this, uh, if you think of the current state of affairs for marine drugs, there are 16 approved drugs that are derived from marine sources and all sorts of types. A large number of them right now that are in clinical trials actually are derived from cyanobacteria uh, and related to the dolostatin series. Um, there are three in phase three clinical trials, two in phase nine and one in phase 16. Uh, and the biggest game changer for a lot of these has been this antibody drug conjugate work, which allows very specific targeting of the, the drug to a location. So there's, if you go through Alejandro's website, you know, a collaborator of mine, he is sort of the leading expert in terms of, of maintaining an, a list of all these clinical trials. Uh, and you can see that a number of them are antibody drug conjugates. So with that, I wrap up here. So I think just in conclusion, I think what I hope you took away from this is that, that you know, nature is a very important source of potential lead compounds for the development of new therapeutics. And a large part of this is because of the, the chem inherent chemical diversity that, that nature provides us and that diversity being driven by sort of an evolutionary design. The other part, I just, if you're thinking about natural products research in general, is that this is a highly interdisciplinary area. We've touched on all sorts of things from chemical synthesis to how do you figure out what a chemical structure is, to pharmacology, uh, to drug conjugates. There's a lot of area here that's really quite fascinating. And so natural products research continues to make very significant contributions to our understanding of the environment, chemical interactions in the environment, uh, those inter chemical interactions with human, humans. And I think really uh, serves as a great example of one of the reasons that we really have to be thoughtful with our conservation efforts, that, that, that this is a great example of the benefit of the environment, I think that resonates with many people. Okay. With that, I'd like to thank everyone for their attention. And I'm happy to take any questions that come up. That's wonderful, Philip. Thank you so much for your talk. It's, you know, I study marine algae too, and I think it's really wonderful to see all these connections between these organisms and interesting to hear about this other side of things, the, the compounds that are useful from these organisms. There are a couple of questions that are coming in through the chat, so we'll start there. Um, I'll also say that people are welcome to unmute their microphones and ask their questions directly. Um, let's start with Cheryl's question. Have there been concerns about Native Hawaiian ownership of local marine resources as there has been with land-based plants? That's a, that's a great question. That's, that's a really great question. So the short answer is yes. Um, when I started as an assistant professor, there was a large number of, of hearings on this in the state, the Department of Land and Natural Resources, to try and look at these issues and find a framework that, that uh, could operate in the state. I think the state of Hawaii has kind of lagged behind this a little bit on the marine resource side though. Um, much of it is kind of viewed in the same vein as commercial collection of, of, of limu. Um, while you're required to have certain types of permits to work in certain areas, I think, um, or use certain types of equipment, the resource sharing or benefit sharing agreements within the state of Hawaii haven't been that uh, really sort of come to the forefront yet. Now, there are much larger agreements that are in place, Nagoya protocols and other sorts of things that are in effect. Um, and so while the state of Hawaii doesn't have a lot of that stuff, the federal government does insist on that. So the research that I do, um, you know, when we talk about sort of you know, drug development in any sort of sense, there are certain expectations that come with that, right? Um, and there has been these expectations for the better part of 30 years within the field of natural products. Um, and I'd say really um, one of the people who've been driving that has been scientists within this field of natural products. Uh, you don't get to go and, and, and collect in Palau or collect in you know, um, Vietnam or Micronesia without really needing the support of the local people that are there. And so uh, one of the things that has been a big part of many projects over the last 20, 25 years in other parts of the, the world has really been resource development, whether that's um, 
ensuring that scientists in those areas have a chance to come to the US and get trained, whether it's infrastructure building along the way, um, as well as then putting agreements in place where there's benefit sharing that comes based on milestones for the development of stuff, right? So those are, those are really, really, really important issues uh, and really important things to sort of sort out and think about at the start of the projects. Yeah, that was a great question. Okay, we have a lot of questions. I'm gonna jump to Rob Jedeke and uh, Rob, go ahead and unmute yourself to ask your question and we'll come back to those in the chat. Yeah, hi, uh, thank you for scaring me and making me never wanna go in the water again. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, with uh, with your diversity figure that you showed, uh, the the similarity between the natural products and the drugs makes me think that most of those drugs came from natural products. And then I'm kind of wondering, what is the main limitation for creating more diverse synthetic compounds? Yeah, so it's great great point and a keen observation. So there's a little bit of a chicken or the egg argument there. Yeah, certainly when you look at the diversity of drugs and the diversity of natural products in that particular slide. So it's maybe not the best way to illustrate that, but certainly the diversity of, of compounds in nature greatly exceeds what we can do synthetically. Now, what's the limiting factor there? Well, to, if we go back to the, let me go back to this example here. So this is an example of, of, of a compound that was been made synthetically by Kishi. This is a hundred step process, hundred steps that went into it with an overall yield of 1%. So the way to think about that is if I take A and make turn it into B, and I do that with 90% efficiency, my yield of B is 90%. That's not bad. But if I have to take B and turn it into C, and I get a 90% yield on that step, then my overall yield is 81%. And this becomes uh, compounded as you go through this process for 100 step synthesis of something this particularly complex. So <laughs> This is really the challenge, the, the, the synthetic challenge, the chemical challenge of making these compounds in an efficient way. You know, no pharmaceutical company, or most pharmaceutical companies don't generally want to do something that is a hundred step synthesis. The cost associated with that is astronomical, right? So they tend to avoid that uh, from their perspective, which is why the idea of being able to take something like this, Right, and find this from a bacterial source where you can ferment it is really uh, so important. As an aside, I didn't talk about it, the structural similarity of these two compounds is important and the fact that this is a bacterial source is important because how they were able to get this approved as a drug and how they were able to get enough of this material to, to, to get this tested, all the testing required, came about because they could produce this in very large quantities and then they devised a very clever way to move from this compound on the right to ET743 synthetically, so they could do a semi-synthetic uh, synthesis of that. Um, and that only required a limited number of steps and was feasible, but great question. Okay, um, there are a couple of questions that came into the chat a while ago. We'll do that and we'll come back to Reinhold who has his hand up. So um, the first one there, has anyone at UH, to your knowledge, looked into whether the cyanobacteria produced co-carcinogen compounds play a role in the tumors of marine turtles? Yeah, great, great question. Uh, and something that uh, I think had been wondered for, for quite a while. I am aware of one study that looked at this uh, involving uh, Jen Smith, who I think uh, was working with Celia, Celia uh, at the time. Um, and she's and Jen is now, I think, at uh, Scripps Institution of Oceanography. And they had looked at the diet of, of turtles and tried to then map on the occurrence of the tumors. And if I remember correctly, they didn't find any significance there. Um, so that's certainly not the main factor responsible. Okay, thank you, Philip. Um, another question then in the chat, could you comment on ciguatera toxin? Yes, can you maybe be a little more specific in terms of what you'd like me to talk about? I can do talk in general. Uh, Probably about... it's, it's origin. My understanding it's from Gambia or discus dinoflagellates, something like that, yeah. is that correct? Yeah, so ciguatoxin is um, again, an, another marine toxin um, that was originally discovered, or the structure was discovered by some Japanese chemists. Uh, it's produced by a, a dinoflagellate, so a small microscopic organism. These are kind of crazy organisms because they're incredibly tiny, but they produce these massive chemicals, the dinoflag, like these ciguatoxin. Um, and ciguatoxin is another example of sort of bioaccumulation, these very small microorganisms 
um, get eaten, right, or, or plants, these organisms get eaten uh, by fish and sort of it starts to accumulate up into fatty tissue as it goes up the food chain. Uh, and so it becomes a concern, of course, for, for local fishermen in that sense. But ciguatoxin poisoning um, is not uh, uncommon, I think, uh, at least it was many years ago. So this is again, another great example about how these sort of human health issues really drove the research in that area. There are, ciguatoxin is sort of everywhere, uh, I'll say as well. Structurally, there's variations in different locations. So for a while, one of my colleagues here in the department was working on the Hawaiian ciguatoxin structure, although that never work never got completed. Okay, thank you, Philip. Uh, let's come back to Reinhold now, with your hand up, very patiently waiting. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you for a wonderful, wonderful presentation. I had no idea that you were actually going to talk about palytoxin because uh, that brings back really, really interesting memories for me because I graduated from a department that actually discovered the mechanism of action, which is converting the, sod the sodium potassium ATPase into an ion channel that collapses the gradient. That was by Ernst Haberman. He was the department yeah. chair where I graduated. Anyways, I that was. Talk about that. <laughs> we never talked about that. But anyway, yeah, but it's fascinating. But I would like to know because you 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 spent some time on it, and it's a fascinating molecule. And you said that it might have some use uh, as as a drug, but it hasn't been pursued. So I was wondering what would you think would be a good use for it? Do you think it should be combined with a, you know, with another uh, uh, an antibody or, or what, is, what, what is your rationale for, for loving palytoxin? Because it's really, really toxic. Yeah, that, that is the challenge with it. I love palytoxin for the structure and mechanism, the whole story of it. Um, and I think, you know, uh, if I take the Hawaii biotech approach, anything that potent has to be good for something. <laughs> That's sort of how they, they developed it. Um, but I think, it, you know, going back as you see these days with these antibody drug conjugates really has dealt with a lot of the toxicity issues, right? Um, and so I think that at the time, Hawaii Biotech was really focused on, on very particular cancer cells, they, lines that they were looking at and potential applications in that area. Thank you. So, about that more, it sounds like fun. Okay, then we have a question that came in from Virginia Hinshaw. I guess two questions. How do these chemicals benefit the bacteria? So I guess thinking back to whether or not there's a, an interplay between the two organisms going in the other direction. Um, and secondly, do, do, is it known which chemical caused Alice Ball's death? Mm, um, I'll take the second one first. So uh, there are a number of different stories on Alice's, uh, Alice's Ball's cause of death. Um, one, I think the official one is listed as TB, if I, if I have the story details correct. The other story that, that I've heard is that she was demonstrating, this is 1940, she was demonstrating gas masks to students and was gasped with chlorine, uh, and that was the, the cause of her death. But again, the details, the official cause of death is listed as TB on that. Uh, to take the first question, what... Uh, is the benefit of these compounds. Now that's a fascinating question in itself, that really is. So in many cases, you, you can look at these organisms and it makes sense that a bacteria produces a compound that is antibacterial so that it can clear out a zone around itself and therefore grab or be able to get all the nutrients in the particular area around it more effectively. Uh, so there's examples of that. There are examples of natural products that go out into the environment and, and grab things like iron, so essential things for, for growth that are, aren't produced naturally uh, by organisms. There are fascinating stories and examples of chemical dynamics. And one of my favorite is, is a terrestrial system where you have these, these uh, um, caterpillars that essentially live on this, um, like to prey on, on a particular leaf, a particular plant. And so the caterpillars eat the plant. And the plant, in response, releases a whole slew of chemicals, a whole slew of natural products. They have absolutely no effect on the uh, caterpillar itself, but they are sex pheromones for predators of the caterpillar. So it suddenly gets damaged, it suddenly releases all these sex pheromones, and all of a sudden the leaves are, are sort of descended on by insects that eat the caterpillar. 
and it takes care of its predators that way. So the relationship here can be really quite, quite complex. Another fascinating example that I love in natural products that I didn't talk about is this idea of, uh, imagine you have two schools of fish that come into each other and that, that, that they, they intersect each other in the ocean. As it turns out, the fish come in, they leave with who they came in with. So the, the pods stay together, even if they mix up and they're the same fish. The way they do that is essentially through chemical smell, right? There's a, a compound in the urine of fish or the leader of the fish that tells it which way to go. Uh, so they're really sort of fascinating stories here. And, and I think we are oversimplifying it a little bit when we say it's always defense. Chemical signaling is such an important aspect of, of, of our environment. Fantastic. Thank you, Philip. I think we'll end our question and answer session at this point. I'd like to extend a final thank you to you, Philip, for your fabulous presentation today. It was really interesting. Thank um, you. And I'd like to thank everyone for attending as well. It's good to see you all. We look forward to seeing you soon. Uh, we have our next event lined up. It's going to be held on Wednesday, April 20th at two o'clock Hawaiian time. It's going to feature Dr. Doug Simons, who is the director of the Institute for Astronomy. Um, he's going to be speaking on a talk that's entitled Astronomy Futurecast. So it sounds like a broad level overview of where he sees the Institute and the discipline going in Hawaii in the future. So watch your inboxes for invitation to that event. Thank you again, Philip, and thank you all. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day or your evening. Aloha.